Welcome to the JCS Guideline Webinar Series. My name is Akihiko Nogami from University of Tsukuba, Japan. I will chair this session with my co-chair, Professor Kurita. Uh, this is a webinar on the JCS JHRS 2021 Guidelines Forecast Update on Non-Pharmacotherapy of Cardiac Arrhythmias. The aim of this webinar is provided uh, education on the most updated basic and clinical topics and to share insights from experts of the field. Our plan of the JCS webinar is to explore collaboration with the cardiovascular societies in other countries. This webinar is delivered on demand. You will find more information on our SNS or the upcoming JCS website that is available next February or March. Uh, today, uh, we are focused on the known pharmacotherapy of arrhythmias. In 2019, JCS JHRS guidelines for known pharmacotherapy of cardiac arrhythmias were published. Following that publication, we decided to publish the focused update version of the guidelines. The main features of the focused update guideline were as follows. About the cardiac electrical implantable devices, needless pacemakers, conduction system pacing, management of ICD in end of life care, lead extraction, anti tachycardia pacing for atrial tachyarrhythmias, management of AF detected by implantable device. And about the catheter intervention for arrhythmias, reducing radiation exposure novel evidence and advanced technologies for catheter ablation of AF, optimal anticoagulation therapy for AF ablation, and finally, left atrial appendage closure device. Uh, today, we focus on the two important topics in the focused update guidelines. First, deactivation of ICD therapy in end-of-life end of care, when and how, and second, subclinical or asymptomatic atrial fibrillation, should we ablate them? Each present presentation is allotted 20 minutes and the further 10 minutes are available for discussion. Uh, let me introduce today's speakers and commentators. Uh, first, my co-chair, Professor Kulita from Kindai University. Um, my name is uh, Takashi Kulita from Kindai University. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you. As commentator, uh, Professor Shoda from Tokyo Women's uh, Medical University. Hello, my name is Moria Shoda, a Department of Cardiology, Tokyo Women's Medical University, and Shinshu University. Thank you. And uh, Professor Yamane from Tokyo GK University School of Medicine. Hello. Uh, my name is Teichi Yamane. Uh, I'm in the uh, GK University School of Medicine. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, as a first speaker, Professor Shiga from Tokyo GK University School of Medicine. Hello, I'm Tsuyoshi Shiga from GK University, Tokyo. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, as a second speaker, Dr. Yamasaki from University of Tsukuba. Hello, uh, my name is Hiro Yamasaki from U University of Tsukuba. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Finally, as a commentator from the US, Dr. Higuchi from the UCSF. Hi, I'm Satoshi Higuchi from University of California, San Francisco. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the first part will be chaired by Professor Kurita. Uh, Professor Kurita, please start your session. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nogami, for introduction. The topic of the first half part of the seminar is uh, the activation of ICD in end-of-life care. The pre presenter is uh, Professor Shiga from Tokyo GK University. Dr. Shiga, could you start your lecture? Thank you, for Chairman. Today, I'd like to talk about the activation of ICD in end-of-life care. I present one case. 
This patient was 68 years old man. He had end-stage hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, heart failure, and sustained ventricular tachycardia. When he was 28 years old, he experienced syncope. He had a family history of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and sudden cardiac death. When he was 49 years old, he had an ICD implantation due to sustained ventricular tachycardia. Thereafter, he experienced PTSD and depression due to ICD shocks. He was upgraded to CRTD due to worsening heart failure, but he was frequently hospitalized due to worsening heart failure. After hospital admission due to worsening heart failure, he needed a temporary IABP for low out syndrome. Doctor said he is approaching the end of life. Patient said, if the IABP extracted, wouldn't I experience worsening heart failure again? Family said, he will get better again. Please perform the maximum treatment. Unfortunately, after that, the treatment with IABP was repeated. Moreover, he experienced frequent ICD shocks. Doctors said the treatment strategy is not possible. Further treatment will be difficult. Patient, I didn't think I was so ill. Family said we didn't expect such a day to come. Problem in these cases were the IABP is difficult to withdraw in the end-stage heart failure. However, the patient and his family have expectations for the treatment of heart failure. Unable to move the palliative care. So, I would like to talk about the activation of ICD in end-of-life care. First, Understanding the concept of palliative care is important. Second, I will discuss how arrhythmia occurs in the patient nearing the end of life. Third, I will discuss the relationship between DNAR order and deactivation of ICDs. Finally, I will discuss the importance and role of advanced care planning for all patients with ICDs. First, concepts of palliative care. According to the WHO definition, palliative care is an approach that improves the quality of life of patients and their families facing the problems associated with life-threatening illness. It provides a relief from pain and other distressing symptoms affirms the patient's life and regards dining as an abnormal process. However, it intends to neither hasten nor postpone death. It includes the psychological and spiritual aspects of the patient care. It offers a support system to help patients live as activity as possible until death. We can use a team approach to address the needs of patient and patient families. ICDs prevent sudden cardiac death, but implantation of the ICD and its therapy, both appropriate and inappropriate shocks, can induce psychological distress. For example, depression, anxiety, anger, or post-traumatic stress symptoms were observed greater levels in the patient and their partners. These psychological issues are major problems for patients receiving long-term ICD therapy. Therefore, patients need to be aware of psychological distress and respond appropriately to these patients. The Ministry of Health, Labor, and Welfare in Japan has defined the term end-of-life care as medical care in the final stage of life. End-of-life care is the support and medical care given during the time of surround death, and it should help the patient live 
as well as possible until death and die with dignity. In general, end-of-life care is included in the palliative care. So when should we provide palliative care to the patient? Rooney and colleague categorized the time course of the functional decline in the final stage of life into four categories. The first pattern is in the cases of sudden death and the specific example include the cardiovascular disease, cerebral vascular disease, and death from accidents. In such cases, the final stage of life is often a lapse of hours to days and emergency intensive care is applied during the same time. The second pattern is cancer. The final stage of life often proceeds on the monthly basis. During the, this period, the patient can spend normal daily life, but there is often sharp decline of function in the last several months. The third category is organ failure. And examples include irreversible liver cirrhosis and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and chronic heart failure. The final stage of life often years and show the gradual decline in function and rapid decline just before death. Firstly, frailty dementia being the most common disease. The final stage of life even a longer process ranging from fewer years to more than 10 years, making it difficult to determine the when the final stage of life occurs. The blue circle shows the time when palliative care should be provided. For end-of-life care, the timing should maybe in the red circles. Next, azimir in the patient nearing the end of life. Shock therapy not only causes pain to the patient, but also distresses the family members who provide care for the patient. Therefore, these painful issues contradict the purpose of the palliative care in the terminally ill patients. This slide shows the sub-study of the merit to trial and the frequency of the terminal ill patient with ICDs who received any ICD shock. None of the deactivated patients received an ICD shock in the 24 hours before death. However, other patients received the shock even during the 24 hours before death. Moreover, in the last week before death, the certain number of the patients received ICD shocks. This slide shows data from Canada with 209 patients diagnosed with cancer after ICD implantation among 1,600 patients with ICDs. The occurrence of PTBF was significantly higher in the patient with cancer than in the patient without cancer. The incidence of PTBF was markedly higher in the patient with stage 4 cancer than in those with earlier stage. In this study, the rate of ICD deactivation in the stage 4 patient was only 35%. Inappropriate therapy also occurred in 14 patients and atrial fibrillation was the most frequent cause. This slide showed our data and the frequency of patients who received any ICD therapy. The frequency of ICD therapy within one month of death was higher in the patient with end-stage heart failure, and some patients received shock within 24 hours of death. It should be recognized that BT or BF is more likely to occur at the end of life. Then, DNAR order and deactivation of ICDs. Here, it is important to know what is do not attempt resuscitation means. DNAR order directs 
the health care team to withhold resuscitation in accordance with the patient wishes. It does not mean do not perform what is likely to succeed. It means don't try performing the what is unlikely to succeed for patients who are unlikely to be resuscitated by CPR. The most important thing is that DNAR order does not mean do not treat. It refers only to not performing CPR. Therefore, prior discussion between patients and patients concerning the DNAR is needed. This slide shows the frequency of ICD deactivation in a patient near the end of life from previous reports. Left figure from Canada, 33% of patients received deactivation of ICD after the DNAR order. However, more than half of patients did not receive DNAR or deactivation of ICD. Right figure from our data, only 24% received deactivation of the ICD after the DNAR order. However, more than half of the patient did not receive deactivation of ICD even after the DNAR order. Unlike in the United States, Canada, and some European countries, there are currently no laws or guidelines regarding DNAR orders in Japan. Japanese physicians may fail to mention the activation of ICDs in discussion of DNAR orders or palliative care for terminal ill patients. Why is an ICD not deactivated in end-of-life care? The reasons for this discrepancy are not clear. It may be that physicians and staff are uncomfortable discussing end-of-life scenario with their patients and may defer those discussions until death. It is also possible that physicians and staff do not understand that ICD deactivation is included in the DNAR order. And physicians may believe that the patient would not be experienced ICD shock prior to death if ICD shock had not occurred in the past few months. Some reports show that about half of patients receive the activation of ICD therapy within 24 hours from the DNAR order, but the remainder received the activation of ICD two days or more after the DNAR order. It may be difficult to decide the timing of ICD deactivation, especially in the patient with end-stage heart failure. However, physicians should recognize that the patient at the risk of shock therapy during this period. It may be preferable to uh, deactivate the ICD treatment promptly or at least within 24 hours after DNA order. From the viewpoint of palliative care, to avoid painful shock. The last advanced care planning. Broad sense ACP refers to discussions among the patient, family, surrogate decision makers, and medical care providers about the patient future treatment care planning while considering the patient value, priority, desires, goals, and preference for future medical care. Narrow sense ACP refers to a voluntary process between the patient and care providers in which the medical care team and patient, his or her family, or the surrogate decision makers discuss future medical care when the patient loses the capacity to make his or her own decisions. The Heart Rhythm Society expert consensus statement states that discussion about device deactivation is essential during ongoing processes and discussion starts when informed consent is obtained prior to ICD implantation and continue over time as the patient's condition and treatment goals change as the disease progresses. Of course, 
advanced care planning for end of life in the patient with ICDs does not mean the deactivation of ICD therapy. However, the condition of patient with cardiovascular disease may suddenly worsen, even if the patient appears to be more stable. Decisions about ICD deactivation must be made considering the patient condition, risk of painful shock, and the termination of life threatening arrhythmias. Advanced discussion regarding the deactivation of ICD therapy during the end of life might be necessary based on advanced care planning. Obtaining the patient state or written advance directive when the patient's condition good would be helpful discussion of ICD deactivation. The recent Japanese Circulation Society guidelines recommend the process of discussion to determine the activation of ICD. Regarding ICD deactivation at the end of life, shared decision-making should be provided with sufficient information based on the ethical background and ACP. Additional explanations such as unnecessary physical and psychological distress caused by ICD shock therapy at the end of life and the disadvantage of not being treated for life-threatening isomia should be discussed with multidisciplinary team including cardiologists, heart failure nurses, arrhythmia specialists, psychiatrists, clinical psychologists, and palliative care staff members. If the patient will can be confirmed, the shared patient will, if there are advanced directive for the end of life, uh, it's have a discussion with the patient, family, and medical staff, and uh, allow the decision making by the patient. But the patient will cannot confirm the medical care team must carefully determine the best course of the action of the patient. The Japanese Circulation Society guidelines state in the Class 2A recommendation that the activation decision should be made in ICD patients who are the end of life. This is my first presented cases. This patient took some time, but after repeated discussion regarding end of life care, including the activation of ICD shocks with multidisciplinary team, he and his family accept the situation of a heart failure, and physician issued a DNA R order to deactivate the ICD. He died two days after the DNA R order. In summary, from the perspective of palliative care, avoiding the pain caused by shock therapy is important. DNA R means not perform CPR only, and DNA orders also include the activation of ICDs. It is possible to retain practical pacing and biventricular pacing function to avoid worsening of symptom. The activation of ICD should be considered from the advanced care planning stage. Shared decision making and discussion with the multidisciplinary team are also needed. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Shiga. Uh, Dr. Shiga excellently summarized the part of the activation of ICD by presenting an impressive case. Uh, I understand that uh, in the actual field, ICD shock therapy still remain active in half of the patients. So I would like to make several comments on his presentation. First, uh, the activation of ICD shock therapy absolutely depends on the de uh, decision of the DNAR created by the multidisciplinary team, including various fields of professionals, patients, and their families. And the DNAAR policy never means to terminate all the therapies, including palli palliative care, to re relieve patients' pain. Second, in our uh, focused update guideline, 
Uh, we have recommended class 2A indication just for the essential process toward the decision making of the activation. So we have avoided to address on actual criteria to activate shock therapy uh, from ICD. And finally, JCS has also published a statement on palliative care in cardiovascular disease in 2021. The statement covers all the aspects of palliative care for heart failure patients, including end of life care. Please refer this statement if the page, uh, participants wanted to uh, obtain more detailed information. Okay, so and I would like to uh, I would like to ask Dr. Yamane and Dr. Nogami about the presentation of the activation of ICD shock. Did you have any experience to terminate shock therapy of ICD in end of life patients, or have you already prepared an actual management protocol for decision making in the activation of ICD? So, uh, Yamane, Dr. Yamane, please. Yes. Uh, in our center, unfortunately, we do not systematically take care of the device deactivation at the end of the life. Okay. How about the Dr. Nogami? Uh, thank you. Uh, we experienced a few cases in whom we had to deactivate ICD at very terminal situations, and in whom we abandoned ICD replacement for battery depletion. However, we don't have a multidisciplinary team like a guideline recommended yet. Okay. As uh, Dr. Yamane and Dr. Nagami mentioned that the systematic process to decide the deactivation shock therapy from an ICD still in preparation even in a two representative hospital in Japan. So in our kinder hospital, the station is almost the same as well. And Dr. Shoda, uh, do you have any comments on the current condition in Japan? So I personally feel the present situation in Japan is a bit behind the guidelines. Oh, yes. Uh, Professor Shiger used to be the associate professor of my institution, Tokyo Image Medical University. Therefore, I totally agree with Dr. Shiga's presentation. <clears throat> but I think the Western countries are very different from the situation in Japan. In Europe and the United States, guidelines for ICD deactivation predate those in Japan. And there have been many discussions on this issue. The reason for this is that Japan does not have a legal system for euthanasia. And there have been cases where medical personnel who have performed euthanasia have been convicted under criminal law. ICD deactivation can be considered negative euthanasia and many healthcare professionals have distanced themselves from this important issue. As this slide shows, many countries in the West have laws regarding euthanasia. On the other hand, euthanasia of any kind is illegal in Russia. In other hands, in other words, the position of euthanasia is clearly defined by law, whereas in Japan and many other countries in Asia and Africa, the legal interpretation of euthanasia is unclear. In this revision of the guidelines, we have provided guidelines for passive euthanasia with ICD deactivation and hope that this issue will continue to be discussed in Japan. That's my comment. Thank you very much, Dr. Shoda. Uh, Dr. Shoda mentioned that the uh, relationship between the DNAR and uh, anesthesia. So uh, Dr. Shiga, do you have some comments on the, uh, Dr. Shoda's comment? Uh, thank you. Uh, euthanasia and uh, uh, dignified deaths are not legalized in Japan. Uh, this is can, uh, is can cause confusion in the medical field 
the purpose of IC deactivation is to prevent the painful shock for patient nearing end of life. Uh, it's one of the palliative care options and part of the compassionate end of life care plan. So in legal terms, ICD deactivation is considered uh, withdrawal medical treatment. It should not be confused with the act of assisting death. The important thing is the advanced care planning discussion with the patient and the family member and medical care team. Mm. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Shigan, I have one uh, question on your presentation. I understand that the um, advanced care planning should be started at the plan, uh, at the ICD implantation. However, I think that it's very hard uh, for patients to tell um, advanced directive or end of life or deactivation matter abruptly, abruptly just after a patient has accepted the implantation ICD. So could you tell us the actual appropriate timing to, to notify the patients uh, the activation of ICD shock? Uh, thank you for Professor Akurita. Uh, in my presentation, I talked about the recommendation of the Heart Rhythm Society. We usually explain the each of the options available to our patients and any risks such as device infection or several injuries prior to ICD implantation. Similarly, uh, physicians may explain ICD deactivation was one of the options. Of course, I think it's difficult. And the actual patient and their physician rarely discuss ICD deactivation. I think that it is better to talk about ICD deactivation with the patient and the family in narrow sense ACP stage. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a stage to discuss future medical care when mm -hmm. the patient cannot make his or her decision. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Shiga. And so we would like to move on the next topic, which will be chaired by uh, Professor Nogami. Professor Nogami, Nogami, please. Thank you. Uh, let's move to the second part. Uh, the second presentation is about the catheter ablation for the subclinical or asymptomatic AF, uh, which is presented by uh, Dr. Yamasaki from University of Tsukuba. Please start the presentation. Thank you, Chairman. Topic of my talk is management of asymptomatic AF patients. I'd like to start with a case presentation. This is 53 years old male presented with asymptomatic persistent AF. AFib was diagnosed at an annual checkup and estimated AFib duration was between 6 to 9 months. So echocardiography demonstrated the preserved ejection fraction and enlarged left atrium. So we talked with the patient about the, the treatment option. He had history of hypertension which was well controlled. Shad score was 1 and Hasplet score was 0. And he was 53 years old, asymptomatic, persistent AFib. The left atrium was already dilated and BNP was 207. So we recommended him direct oral anticoagulations and with the rhythm control therapy, we discussed about anti Ultimate drugs and also the catheter ablation at the first line therapy. Patient agreed to take direct oral anticoagulation and also the anti ultimate drugs. So we initiated Bepodil 100 mg, Flecainid 100 mg, and Bisoprolol. Within two months, he was restored in sinus rhythm. However, there was no improvement of symptom and BNP was still 202. Due to sinus bradycardia, flecaine and bisoprolol was stopped and only bepridil was continued. After another two months, he was still in sinus rhythm. We again discussed about the catheter ablation, but he was asymptomatic 
and he denied to go for the cast ablations. Therefore, we referred him to a general physician. After one year, he came back to us with a fever recurrence. This time, he complained of severe dyspnea. Bepidil was a titrate to 200 mg but was not effective. Repeated echocardiography shows reduced ejection fraction, as you can see in the right hand side. Um, left atrium volume was further increased. We again discussed about the catheter ablation. At the initial presentation, he was asymptomatic, persistent fib, and catheter ablation with class 2b indications. But this time, he had symptomatic persistent fib, and now catheter ablation becomes class 2a indications. He underwent catheter ablation using 3D mapping system and extensive PB isolation without any additional ablation was performed. Post voltage map demonstrated the preserved voltage of the left atrium. Improvement of symptom was observed soon after the procedure and sinus rhythm was maintained over a year without any antiarrhythmic drugs. Repeated echocardiography demonstrated improvement of left ventricular function and also the reduction of the left atrial volume. To summarize the case, this was the 53 years old male initially presented with a symptomatic AFib Antiarrhythmic drug was effective but transient, and recurrence of a fib with severe symptom and reduced systolic function was observed, and catheter ablation successfully suppressed a fib and improved the cardiac function and also reduced left atrial volume. So, question from this case is. Should we consider catheter ablation in asymptomatic AFib patients at, the, uh, at the, the initial presentation? And what is the goal for management of AFib patients? Is it symptom or the, the future cardiovascular events? Now I'd like to move to the, the topic of catheter ablation for asymptomatic AFib patients. Term asymptomatic AFib is often used and this ELA symptom scale is used to describe the patient the condition. The score one is asymptomatic AFib if patient AFib does not cause any symptom. However, this symptom scale is physician assessed tool for quantification of a fib related symptom. This is an interesting stop a study enrolling thirty four patients with asymptomatic persistent fib. All patients underwent catheter ablations during the follow up. Some of the patient is recurrence and some of the patients remain in sinus rhythm. They compare the patients without any recurrence in blue bars and with recurrence. As you can see, when compared to patients without any recurrence, they have the, the improvement of the functional status. although they were considered to be asymptomatic patients. 
So actually, who are two asymptomatic AFib patients? We know they have the, the recovery, but we we know it because they underwent the catheter ablation. It's quite difficult to 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 really know patients who's going to have the recovery who are true asymptomatic AFib patients. The catheter ablation for AFib is an established treatment for the sim symptom relief. However, is catheter ablation more effective than medical therapy to improve cardiovascular outcomes? The Cabana study is conducted to answer this question. The Cabana trial enrolled patients over 65 years old were patients under 65 years old, but with at least one risk factor for thromboembolism. 2,204 patients were randomized in one-to-one -one fashion, one in catheter ablation, and the other in drug therapy. Enrolled patient has the average of 68 to years old, paroxysmal AFib around 42%, Persistent AFib around 47% and long standing AFib around 10%. The median shot 2 basque score was 3. In catheter ablation group, 9% of those patients actually did not receive catheter ablations. Moreover, 27.5% of the patients randomized in drug therapy group actually received catheter ablation during follow-up. Those number of patients close over to the other treatment group impact the, the outcome of the Cabana trial, makes it difficult to interpret the result. Primary endpoint of Cabana study is death, disabling stroke, major bleeding, cardiac arrest. During a median follow up of 48.5 months, there was no statistically significant differences between drug therapy and catheter ablation. But as I mentioned in the previous slide, a number of patients. We had crossover, and those patients makes it difficult to interpret this result. The sub-analysis of the Cabana study demonstrated that patients below 65 years old, the catheter ablation has fable outcome statistically favorable outcome compared to drug therapy. Hazard ratio was 0 0.52. And also, there was not statistically significant difference. However, there was tendency to have favorable outcome in catheter ablation group when patient has history of congested heart failure. Because there was uh, many patients underwent the crossover to the other therapy. This slide showed the out primary endpoint of the patients on treatment analysis. So patients randomized into the drug therapy, actually 27.5% underwent catheter ablation. So those patients underwent catheter ablation is included in the orange line in this slide. So when compared to the drug therapy, there was the significant reduction of the, the event rate. 
in the cat stat ablation. So the cat stat ablation appeared to have the better outcome when compared to the drug therapy. But this is on treatment analysis. So another question is in which timing do AFib patients have cardiovascular events and how should we manage AFib? The timing of cardiovascular event in AFib patients was described in Fusimi AFib registry. This was the AFib registry conducted in Japan. Patients were uh, divided in three groups. One is the patient with paroxysmal and AFib without any progression to sustain AFib during the observation period. It's described in the left hand side. And in the right hand side, this is the patient with sustained AFib throughout the observation period. And in the center, this patient was initially paroxysmal and became sustained AFib during the observation period. As you can see, the ischemic stroke with heart failure hospitalization was frequently observed in periprogression period. The periprogression period was defined that one year period changing from paroxysmal to sustained AFib. So progression of AFib was associated with increased risk of clinical advanced events. So maybe we have to notice this timing and try to, to suppress the AFib before the AFib change into the, the sustained form. The East AFib Net 4 trial, early treatment of AFib for stroke prevention trial, enrolled patient subjects over 75 years old with history of stroke or transient ischemic stroke or have two of the cardiovascular risk factors. And those patients had the AFib diagnosed within 12 months before enrollment. This study compared the impact of the army rhythm control to the usual care. 2,789 patients were randomized into one-to-one -one fashion, one in early rhythm control group and the other in the usual care group. They were around 70 years old and first episode of patient with first episode of AFib was around 38%. And paroxysmal AFib was 36% of the patients and persistent AFib around 26 patients. Shantz to basque score was 3.324 patients. And when compared to the Cabana trial, they were a little bit older and had higher risk factors. In the patient randomized into the arm rhythm control group, Castor ablation was selected was selected around eight percent of the patients, and the other patients were treated with the antiarrhythmic drugs. This slide shows the, the primary endpoint of East AFNet four trial. The median follow up duration was five point one year, and primary outcome of this trial was a composite of death from cardiovascular causes stroke or hospitalization with worsening of heart failure or acute coronary syndrome. When compared to the usual care, arm rhythm control demonstrated the statistically significant reduction of the cardiovascular events. So how about the outcome in asymptomatic AFib patients. This is a sub-analysis of East AFNet 4 trial. The patient 
asymptomatic AFib patients at baseline was presented in the left hand side and patient with symptomatic AFib is demonstrated in the right hand side. As you can see, the early rhythm control has shown the similar reduction of the primary endpoint even in asymptomatic AFib patients. So from these data, how should we manage asymptomatic AFib patients? We should care about, consider about the age, echocardiographic parameters, AFib duration, number of cardiovascular risks, and how we can manage them, the observation, what anti arrhythmic drug, and the capstan ablations, and in which timing should we change our mind, even in asymptomatic paroxysmal AFib, or the, when patients uh, progress into persistent AFib. How should we interpret results from Cabana trial and its AFNET4 trial and change our practice for treatment of symptomatic AFib patients? Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yamasaki. Uh, very wonderful presentation, including the review of the trials. Uh, I want to add some uh, information about the Bepri deal. Uh, which was uh, used in Japan, and there is an anti arrhythmic drug with a multi channel blockade, and uh, which is useful for uh, restoration of the science rhythm. Uh, Dr. Kurita, uh, would you comment on your policy or indication of catheter ablation for asymptomatic AFI patient in your institution? Dr. Kurita, please. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Nogami. So I completely agree with uh, Dr. Yamazaki's strategies. So we are very positive to perform the uh, cash ablation for asymptomatic uh, patients, especially for young uh, patients, less than 70 years old, with uh, less than two years from the onset of a persistent AFib, and not so enlarged left atrium, mildly and moderate uh, redu uh, reduced ejection fraction and mitral regurgitation. Uh, these patients are very, very prone to respond to the ablation procedure. And these pre-existing uh, abnormalities can be improved in almost all patients after restoration of a science rhythm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, how about you, uh, Dr. Shoda? Uh, I have no other comment because uh, my indication for subclinical or uh, asymptomatic atrial fibrillation is very similar to Dr. Kurita. No other comment. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Yamane, I think you prepare some slides for the discussion, right? Yes. Uh, yes. Thank you. Please, please. I will show my slide. Show. Yes. Okay, uh, I want to make uh, some discussion. Uh, it's well known that asymptomatic AFib accounts for about 40% of general AFib cases. And the prognosis of asymptomatic AFib has been shown to be worse compared to symptomatic AFib cases. And regardless of the presence or absence of symptoms, ablation has been demonstrated to improve the uh, patient prognosis uh, in AFib cases in non-RCT studies. However, the indication of aberration for asymptomatic AFib is, is still not established. And the main purpose of AFib aberration remained unchanged. That is improvement of symptoms and QOL of the patients. Let's see the current uh, clinical practice uh, from the JAB registry. This is Japanese uh, Japan Ablation Registry. Uh, currently, symptomatic AFib accounts for the 81% uh, of the all AFib ablation cases. 
soul uh, asymptomatic cases is about uh, 20 percent uh, maybe a little bit less than 20 percent and now in japan the total number of a fever ablation uh, is over 70 thousand cases so uh, about 14 thousand uh, ablation uh, procedures uh, uh, currently performed uh, in asymptomatic AFib cases in Japan. It's not a small number. But uh, however, in contrast to the uh, broad performance of catheter ablation for asymptomatic cases, the guideline indication is not high enough. Look at this. Uh, these are the uh, guidelines uh, in uh, the uh, several uh, countries and the JCS uh, or the HRS. Uh, in HA and ESC guidelines, uh, operation for the asymptomatic AFib is uh, not indicated, no indication. And in JCS, our guideline and the expert consensus of HRS, the recommendation uh, level is class 2B. The reason of these uh, known indication in both HA and ESC guidelines are described. Look at this. In HA, the, uh, they show that the Recent Kavana showed that AFib ablation was not superior to drug therapy for the primary cardiovascular outcomes. This is the reason. And ESC, as no RCT has yet demonstrated an improvement of prognosis with AFib cassette ablation in the general AFib uh, populations, the indication for the procedure have not been broadened beyond symptom relief and AFib ablation is generally not indicated in asymptomatic patients. So the reason is the Kavana. Kavana is the reason for known indication. So uh, go back to the Kavana. As uh, Prof. Dr. Yamazaki uh, clearly showed, and uh, it is well known that the Kavana is uh, often focused with, uh, with these two uh, figures. That means the difference of the uh, prognosis in ITT analysis and the uh, PAP protocol analysis. Someone will say that the Kavana is a negative study, but so someone will say, others will say that the Kavana is a positive uh, study. But more essentially, we must think about Kavana. Does Kavana tell us the truth? First of all, study period started in 2009. That means before balloon, before contact force, and before abrasion index, or blah, 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 which will be related to the lower efficiency of the cassette abrasion. The uh, cases of AFib were all, uh, all symptomatic in Kavana. That is the reason why many crossover cases, nearly 30% happened, occurred in Kavana from drug to abrasion. Lastly, uh, persistent AFib is uh, more than 50%. Again, this will be related to the lower efficiency of the ablation and persistent AFib is uh, after periprogression period as showed uh, by Dr. Yamazaki. Uh, that means the uh, lower event rate uh, in these cases, even without ablation. So Kavana study does not well fit does not well match the current situation of a fever ablation, I think. 
So let's look back to the index cases. When was the best timing of ablation? Uh, in that case, uh, the patient was initially asympto asymptomatic, which was combated to sinusism by the, uh, the arrhythmic drug. And then uh, tacit ablation was performed after patient became symptomatic, like this. Of course, this case was okay. The patient course was good after ablation so far. But we must think about that there will be other better timings for the ablation in this case. Uh, the, past, the first will be the uh, timing uh, when the patient was asymptomatic and uh, soon after the diagnosis of AFU. And the second timing will be after sinusism conversion. From the evidence of East AFNet 4, it would be better to perform ablation much earlier and the low recommendation level in guideline may delay the suitable timing of ablation in many asymptomatic AFib cases in the world. As summary, current guidelines do not match or do not, do not catch up with the recent advancement of clinical practice of the cassette ablation for asymptomatic AFib cases. We hope the progression of recommendation level to A or to B in asymptomatic cases, of course, not all, but in selected cases. As for the evidence of guideline update, we may need another RCT to evaluate the meaning of the AFI vibration. Thank you for your attention. Uh, th thank you, uh, Dr. Yamane. Uh, thank you very much for the excellent discussion. Uh, as you mentioned, the Kavana trial has a lot of limitations. I think that we have to escape the cost of Kavana. <laughs> uh, Dr. Yamane is a se section also of AF ablation in focused update guideline. I think uh, he already prepared the next for the next guideline updating. Uh, Dr. Yamasaki, uh, do you have any comment on the Dr. Yamane's discussion? Uh, thank you. Uh, I think we electrophysiologists are quite positive for performing the cast ablation in asymptomatic AFib patients. And in the same time that to maximize the benefit of cast ablation, uh, we really have to take a balance of effectiveness and also the safety when performing the, the, the procedure. In the Cabana trial, the procedure were done only in the high volume center and the complication rates were quite low. So I think it is also our, uh, uh, when we do the, the procedure, we have to really talk about with the patient, uh, including our updated knowledge and consider an individual approach. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to ask Dr. Higuchi, who is now working in UCSF, how about the situation of ablation of asymptomatic AFib in US? Dr. Higuchi, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nogami. Uh, as Dr. Yamane mentioned, since we only have HRS consensus statements and no specific indication, decision-making would be based on each doctor's philosophy and discussion with the patients. But I think the important factors to favor ablation in the US are similar to those in Japan, such as younger age, pre or peri progression AF stage, or presence of AF mediated cardiomyopathy. Among those, I think age factor plays a very important role in our clin clinical practice. Indeed, the latest Kavana sub study showed age-based variations with the largest and absolute benefits of ablation in younger patients, while no prognostic benefits in the elderly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Shoda, I think this discussion contains uh, some issues for the next revision of the guideline. What do you think? Okay, so uh, these topics Deactivation of ICD and uh, ablation treatment 
for subclinical or asymptomatic atrial fibrillation. Uh, so interesting for me. In the case of a fibrillation, we are considering our daily practice at the level beyond the guidelines, as Dr. Yamane mentioned. Whereas in the case of ICD deactivation and passive euthanasia, we have not yet caught up with the level of guidelines. By comparing these two contrasting topics, this JCS guidelines webinar helped us understand that guidelines are not rules for us medical professionals, but materials for better medical treatment. That's my comment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for the uh, good comment for the entire this webinar. Uh, thank you very much. I, I'm very sorry to have to limit this interesting discussion, but uh, our time is almost up. Uh, Dr. Kulita, uh, please close uh, this webinar. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nogami. Uh, as we presented, uh, this uh, JCS and the JHS guideline is very, very well written. So uh, we would appreci appreci appreciate if you could use this guideline for practical management in every situation when you face the patient with cardiac arrhythmias. So before closing this seminar, I would like to announce that we are planning to provide the next JCS webinar series volume three entitled JCS JHFS 2021 guideline focused update on diagnosis and treatment of acute and chronic heart, chronic heart failure, which has been scheduled to broadcast on Saturday, January 29th from 2 to 3 p.m. So we expect many colleagues will participate in this seminar. But finally, I deeply appreciate all the doctors for giving us their excellent lectures and comments and all my colleagues participating in this seminar. Thank, thank you very much again. See you in the coming next webinar. Goodbye. Goodbye. Sayonara. <laughs>